Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining our webinar. My name is Mark Higgins. I'm the Chief Operating Officer and Co-Founder of Beacon Platform. Uh, Beacon sells an enterprise technology platform for quants, data scientists, and developers designed to kind of let you focus on your edge. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about applying an interesting new machine learning technique called deep hedging to the problem of hedging and reserving against variable annuity issuance by life insurers. A quick overview of what we're going to do in this uh, uh, presentation. First of all, we'll review deep hedging, the kind of original technique of deep hedging. Um, uh, it's a technique that allows you to improve deriv derivative hedging performance beyond the traditional risk-neutral pricing approach. Then we'll talk about variable annuities, you know, this kind of introduce variable annuities and talk about the different kinds of problems that life insurers have managing these. And then finally, we'll apply deep hedging to that variable annuity problem and show how um, it gives you better hedges, a smaller reserve, and also makes the uh, reserve calculations kind of computationally feasible to do. Before we get into deep hedging though, let's start with the stuff that's behind all of it, which is risk neutral pricing. So risk neutral pricing is kind of the core of derivatives pricing and hedging that people have used since the 70s. Um, it, it's really powerful and it's been a, an amazing tool, uh, but it does make a few key assumptions. Uh, the first one is that when you do hedges, there's no transaction costs and there's no kind of like notional constraints on your hedge trades. Second one is that when you do hedging, you're dynamically rebalancing your hedges continuously. So every time the market ticks, you're making little incremental uh, rebalances to your hedges. And the third one is that there's no unhedgeable risks. So that all the risks that you have to your P&L performance are things that you can hedge with market instruments. In practice, as we know, all those assumptions are violated kind of all the time to some degree or another. Uh, you know, there's non-zero bid ask spreads for hedge trades, and for less liquid markets, those can be quite large. Um, people don't rebalance their hedges continuously, partly to you know minimize the transaction costs that they pay. And often in real world uh, uh, financial problems, there are risks that can't be hedged at all or can hedge, be hedged only imperfectly. Um, so if you think about what that means in the traditional uh, uh, kind of risk neutral limit, when, you are, when all those uh, assumptions are satisfied, if you think about kind of the histogram of your profit and loss, your P&L, over the life of your portfolio, in, uh, in, risk neutral, in a risk neutral world, that post hedges P&L distribution is super skinny. Your P&L is 100% gonna be at one level. Your P&L distribution looks like a delta function. When those assumptions start violated though, what happens is that P&L distribution starts to spread out and you have some variance on your, uh, um, your P&L performance. Um, so in practice, people have to decide how to balance uh, cost versus residual risk on that stuff. Often there's lots of different hedge instruments that can be traded to hedge a particular risk with different kind of risk reward trade-offs. So there's proxy hedging you might be able to do. Um, you also have to decide what your hedging objectives are. Do you want to just kind of maximize the mean of that P&L distribution? Do you want to minimize the variance? Do you want to minimize some other more complicated thing like expected shortfall? So you have to kind of decide what those things are. And people do that in practice all the time. And the problem with the risk neutral pricing is that it doesn't give you a framework to do that. It ends up being kind of ad hoc. Deep hedging is a interesting technique um, using neural networks that are applied to front office derivatives pricing and risk problems. And in fact, it's the first case that I know of anyways um, that practically applies those in, the, in that kind of space. There's lots of other cases of complex machine learning algorithms being used in uh, electronic trading or uh, fraud detection and things like that. This is the first case I've seen where we can use a real complex machine learning algorithm for front office derivative pricing and risk problems. It was introduced in a February 2018 paper uh, by Hans Bueller in JP Morgan's Quantitative Research Group and some of his colleagues in academia. Um, I've got a link to uh, the deep hedging paper there. Um, if you want to take a look, it's, it's really quite an elegant paper. Um, the basic idea, though, is if you imagine uh, the hedging problem. So at any, you've got some portfolio. At any particular time, there's some you know, market state. You kind of take your portfolio characteristics and the market data and you stick them into some kind of complicated nonlinear function. And what that function spits out is, what hedge should I do? In risk neutral pricing, that nonlinear function is something like the Black-Scholes delta formula or some more complicated version of that. 
Um, deep hedging generalizes that. And the way it does that is it says, I'm gonna look at the distribution of my lifetime P&L, including my hedging strategy. Um, so the post hedges lifetime P&L distribution. Um, I'm gonna choose some, some uh, thing that I wanna optimize on that P&L distribution. And in deep hedging, that's some convex risk measure. Um, a standard one of those is expected shortfall. So um, if you're unfamiliar with expected shortfall, say a 70 percentile expected shortfall, what you do is you calculate your 70 percentile value at risk off of that P&L distribution. The, the 70 percentile expected shortfall then is the, the expected amount I lose conditioned on losing more than the 70 percentile value at risk. That's kind of an interesting metric because it includes both the variance of the distribution as well as the mean of the distribution. Um, the idea with deep hedging is I wanna say, you know, that nonlinear function that tells me what hedges to do, I'm gonna make that be a neural network uh, and then what I'm gonna do is train the parameters of that neural network to minimize this convex risk measure I've chosen. Um, so the way that typically works is you'll take a batch of Monte Carlo paths, um, simulate forward through time uh, on each path, on each path date, I'm gonna ask the neural network to tell me what hedges to do. It'll tell me initially there'll be some random number. Um, put on those hedges, I get to the end of that, uh, that simulation, I calculate my, um, convex risk measure, say my expected shortfall. Then I run a whole bunch of those different batches, tweaking the parameters of the neural network and, uh, and gradually converge those parameters to tell me the most optimal hedging strategy to minimize that convex risk measure. An important point here is that this isn't model free. I'm not training this against like a historical time series of real market data. I still need to define some underlying set of stochastic processes as kind of the dynamical model behind that, just like risk neutral pricing. So I still have to say, you know, am I using geometric branding motion or stochastic volatility or whatever? So it lets me take that same kind of underlying dynamical model framework. The difference between deep hedging and risk neutral pricing is kind of the numerical technique that we choose to figure out how to tell me what hedges to do under that model. It's got some interesting consequences. Um, the first one is, I don't need a risk neutral probability measure anymore. That risk neutral probability measure is kind of at the core of risk neutral pricing, uh, where you uh, basically essentially replace the drifts on your real world stochastic processes with some risk neutral drifts. You don't need to do that anymore in deep hedging. Everything's done in the real world probability measure. One nice thing about it is that it reproduces the standard risk neutral results in the limit when those assumptions the risk neutral assumptions are satisfied. So when you can do continuous hedging, there's no transaction costs, there's no unhedgeable risks. Then in that case, if I were to use the risk neutral hedging strategy, that would make my post hedges P&L distribution a delta function, a spike with zero variance. Um, and so that minimizes every convex risk measure. And so the, uh, the deep hedger will train the neural network to find the risk neutral hedging strategy. So in the limit, the, the standard risk neutral limit, deep hedging reproduces it, but then it lets you generalize. You can add any kind of realistic market model that you want for transaction costs. You can include unhedgeable risks that are there, uh, infrequent hedging, constraints on hedges like hedge size constraints. You can allow for you know, a bunch of different hedges um, uh, 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 that you could possibly proxy hedge your risk with, and it'll tell you, the, you know, how to balance your hedges between the different proxies and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it basically gives you the same results as risk neutral pricing in the risk neutral limit, but gives you a quantitative framework for generalizing beyond that. The original deep hedging paper applied this approach to a Heston stochastic volatility model uh, and equity option pricing. Um, but we see a, a much wider applicability of this approach, especially for hedging problems where there are kind of material hedging constraints. At Beacon, we've looked at uh, kind of two research and development problems uh, the first one's in the commodity space, uh, for examples, uh, you know, the right where, where a commodity shop might buy the right to run a gas-fired power plant. So a gas-fired power plant might be like, um, I can burn natural gas and make electricity. So when gas prices are low and power prices are high, I choose to turn it on, burn gas, generate electricity and make a profit. But if gas prices are high and power prices are low, then I'd lose money by running my plant, so I don't. So it looks like kind of a spread option uh, between electricity and natural gas prices. Um, 
And if you're smart about uh, treating that like a real option, then you can dynam dynamically hedge your, uh, your delta risks to gas and to power and kind of lock in that option value. Uh, and so that's kind of an interesting business problem in the commodity space. People typically approach that using risk neutral pricing, but those risk neutral assumptions are violated pretty heinously in those markets in a lot of cases. And so deep hedging gives you a nice way to, to generalize. The problem we're gonna look at today though is around life insurance. Uh, um, where life insurers issue variable annuity products. Variable annuities, we'll talk more about them in a second. They look kind of like long dated um, equity options conditioned on mortality. And so they're long dated. The underlying equity options markets are pretty illiquid for long dated options. Um, there's often unhedgeable risks associated with uncertainty around when different investors in, in variable annuities will die. Um, and uh, uh, regulators require insurers to hold reserves against variable annuity portfolios that are that are defined in terms of expected shortfall of the lifetime P&L distribution, which is exactly something that deep hedging lets you um, minimize through your hedging strategy. So that's kind of the uh, uh, the quick overview of deep hedging and why it's interesting. Um, we're gonna uh, turn now to talk about uh, variable annuities. So for people who aren't familiar with variable annuities, a variable annuity is basically a tax advantaged investment account where you invest in an equity fund um, and then uh, you hold it, it you know, hopefully increases in value. And then when you get to retirement, it converts into an annuity and it has some life insurance protection built in. There are lots of, you know, lots of varieties of this thing and they can get pretty complicated, but the simplest version and the one that we're gonna look at in this talk is a case where, uh, say I'm, a, I'm the investor, I invest like $1,000 into an investment account. If I die before retirement, then my beneficiary gets the maximum of the value of my investment account and a guaranteed minimum death benefit. And that's typically equal to the initial investment amount. So say I put in $1,000, if I die before retirement and my investment account is worth more than my initial $1,000, then my beneficiary just gets my investment account and the life insurer doesn't have to do anything. They have no liability in that case. But if I die before my retirement and my investment account is lost value, so the value of my account is less than $1,000, then first of all, my beneficiary gets my investment account, but the life insurer then has to make up the difference between the value of the account and the initial $1,000. So they have a liability that looks like a put option. So basically when um, uh, the life insurer issues a variable annuity, they're kind of short equity put options, but equity put options that are conditioned on mortality. Um, if I'm uh, issuing, if I'm selling an option, I need to get paid for, uh, for that option. And that's typically paid kind of an, on an ongoing basis through a fee, an ongoing fee that investors pay as long as they're alive. So that's kind of the simplest version of a variable annuity. Um, a typical and variable, a typical insurer's uh, portfolio might contain tens or hundreds of thousands of these variable annuity policies for different investors, um, and it contains uh, kind of a, in, a, a new risk that's specific to insurance called longevity risk or mortality risk, and this is really uncertainty about the timing of individual investor deaths. In this research, we looked at a pretty simple model where every investor's death is independent and modeled through a Poisson process. Um, the frequency of, of death in that Poisson process, of course, really varies with time and with age of the person and subpopulation and all that stuff. To keep things simple in this, we're just assuming a constant frequency. Um, uh, and that risk can diversify away. So as I increase the number of investors uh, uh, in that kind of model, the uncertainty about the fraction of those investors who die in a given time interval gets diversified. And in the limit of an infinite number of investors, I know exactly what fraction they're gonna die in a given time interval, and the only remaining risk is market risk. But with a finite number of investors, I have this additional kind of unhedgeable risk uh, uh, due to not being sure about what fraction die in a given interval. Uh, we also need to model the uh, underlying equity price for the equity in their investment account. Um, for our analysis, we assume just a single equity and we assume a simple process for it that it follows just geometric grounding in motion with a constant drift and volatility. And remember that that drift is the real world drift. We're not doing this in a risk neutral measure. We're looking at the real world drift of the equity and that's gonna be important later. 
Um, we'll also assume uh, uh, zero interest rates, and we'll assume zero transaction costs on our hedges. Like I mentioned, you can add any kind of uh, more complicated transaction cost model that you like, but for the first example here, we're just going to assume zero transaction costs. So if we think about um, what this means from the perspective of the insurer, they have kind of uh, two, uh, two aspects to the value of their portfolio. The first one, uh, which is on the left here, is how much I expect to pay out because people die at different times at the final retirement date, big T, um, when they die and their account value is less than uh, uh, the guaranteed minimum death benefit. And then on the right, uh, the second term here is how much I expect to get from the fees that they're paying me as long as they're alive, as a fraction of their account value. Um, so if I want to calculate sort of the expected value of this thing, I have to figure out what probability measure I use for that. And, in, uh, and traditionally, people have used the risk-neutral measure, uh, assuming that we're dynamically hedging away all of our risks. And assuming, of course, that all the other um, uh, assumptions of risk-neutral pricing hold. Um, so we can simplify this a little bit, uh, uh, putting in our assumptions about, you know, a constant um, uh, uh, Poisson frequency of death lambda, uh, zero interest rates and all that kind of stuff. And if we do this under the risk neutral measure, I can write out the value of my portfolio here. And uh, it basically looks like kind of the weighted sum of a bunch of put options. P here is a put option on the account value. Um, struck at the guaranteed uh, minimum death benefit and the account value is just some function of the equity price. So it's the initial value times the return on the equity and then decaying based on the fee. And then there's a contribution from the fee as well. Um, so that's kind of thinking about how you think about the value of your variable annuity portfolio. But um, uh, insurers also ha have to hold a reserve against that variable annuities. And the regulators specify that as the 70 percentile expected shortfall of the lifetime P&L distribution from the insurer's perspective. When they calculate that reserve, though, the insurer has, has a choice. They can choose whether when they calculate that lifetime P&L distribution to uh, be kind of like the unhedged variable annuity portfolio or whether they want to include a rules-based hedging program. Uh, so at every step through their, uh, the, the reserve is like a Monte Carlo simulation. So at every path and at every path date, you go and calculate what hedges to put on, include those hedges in your simulation. And then the P&L distribution in that case ends up being the post hedges P&L distribution. So the insurer can choose whether to do that, whether to um, have kind of like a naked uh, variable annuity portfolio P&L distribution or the post hedges P&L distribution. Uh, the regulators specify the kind of Monte Carlo, Carlo simulation that you have to do in terms of equity and interest rate paths simulated in the real world probability measure, so not the risk neutral probability measure. Um, in real, the real world measure, equity drifts are typically eight or nine percent. Volatility, um, you know, typically based on uh, kind of long run historical averages. Um, in our example, we're just using geometric gradient motion and zero interest rates, but the um, uh, the processes that regulators specify end up having stochastic volatility for the equities and stochastic interest rates. So with all the assumptions that we're making in our kind of simplified version of this, I can write down kind of a semi-closed form expression for the delta of my variable annuity portfolio just by differentiating that um, expression for the value with respect to spot. Um, and uh, so I get, end up with something that that's involves like one numerical integral over Black-Scholes delta, so it's kind of semi-closed form. Um, it is kind of unusual though to have this simple a calculation for delta. In practice, when you have more complex underlying market models, so when you include stochastic volatility and stochastic rates, and when you have more complex variable annuity terms, you don't get a closed form expression for delta. And what that means is that when I, when I calculate delta, I have to do that numerically, typically through a Monte Carlo simulation. That's going to be important later. So in our simplified model, let's look at what happens uh, to my reserve calculation if I include a hedging strategy or if I don't. So I've got uh, um, uh, kind of two lifetime P&L histograms here. The green one corresponds to the, uh, the P&L distribution if I don't hedge at all. And the orange one corresponds to the P&L distribution if I do hedge. So if I just sort of naively look at the expected shortfalls of these two things, and, and by the way, 
the 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 orange one, I'm assuming I'm uh, rebalancing my hedges once a month in my in this simulation. Um, if I uh, increase my hedging frequency, then that orange distribution would get tighter and tighter until it becomes a delta function in the limit that I that I'm doing continuous hedging. Um, uh, but a couple things to to note. Well, for, first of all, I'm using a 5% equity drift in this example, 20% volatility in five-year uh, variable annuity in this example. Um, the first thing to notice is the mean of this green distribution is kind of shifted off to the right. And the reason for this is that um, when an insurer issues variable annuities, they're essentially selling put options. And when I sell a put option, that makes me long the market. So I'm long the market in a market where I have a positive 5% drift. And so on average, I'm gonna make money by being long the market. So the mean of this distribution is shifted off to the right, but because it's unhedged, it has a, it's pretty broad. And so if you look at the expected shortfall of the green distribution, you know, maybe it's around here somewhere, it's 70 percentile expected shortfall, and the orange one is much smaller. So in this, in this example, it's pretty clear that it's, I get a smaller reserve if I include a hedging strategy when I calculate my P&L distribution. But that isn't necessarily always the case. You can imagine as I kind of crank up my equity drift here, it's gonna shift this green distribution more and more to the right without really changing the, the width that much. And you could imagine there'd be a point where the 70 percentile expected shortfall actually goes to zero, right? Where the expected amount I lose conditional on losing more than the 70 percent value at risk is zero. And then if I keep increasing the risk, then I actually make money in that case. Um, that's kind of weird because it means that I'm incentivized then to not include a hedging strategy when I calculate my uh, uh, my reserves. So let's dig into that a little bit more. So um, I'm going to try and calculate kind of the threshold for equity drift above which it's better for me not to include a hedging strategy. That is, I'll get a smaller reserve if I um, don't include a hedging strategy than if I do. So uh, on the x-axis of this chart, I've got equity volatility. You know, here's like 20% volatility. On the y-axis, I've got the equity drift, and the lines here correspond to variable annuities of different tenors. The red one is a five-year tenor variable annuity going down to the gray one, which is a 20-year variable annuity. So uh, if the equity drift is above the line, that means it's better for me, in terms of the reserves I have to hold, not to include a hedging strategy. And below the line, it's better for me to include a hedging strategy. So you know, if we imagine you know, uh, a five-year variable annuity here at 20% volatility, then if the equity drift is above, I guess, you know, sort of 10.2 or so, then it's better for me in terms of my, if I want to minimize res reserves, not to include a hedging strategy. And if it's below that line, uh, then it's better for me to, to include a hedging strategy. And the complicated part is real-world equity drifts are sort of eight or 9%, real-world volatility is about 20%. So I'm landing right in the zone, kind of right near the threshold in practice. Um, and, and so it's kind of complicated to figure out, like, should I include a hedging strategy or not? But this assumes that I only have two choices, I, that my choice is hedge the whole time using the risk-neutral um, uh, hedges or don't ever hedge at all. In practice, maybe something else would be better. Like, maybe I want to under hedge um, and maybe like, you know, uh, hedge more completely as it gets closer to expiration. As you can see here, this threshold um, goes lower the longer dated my variable annuities are, which kind of makes sense. That, that just means, you know, the longer dated the variable annuity is, the more time um, the equity drift has to kind of shift that distribution over to the right. Um, so maybe like if I have a, a 20 year variable annuity, initially I don't want to hedge at all, but then as time progresses and it becomes shorter data, I want to start hedging. Um, it's kind of unclear in traditional risk neutral frameworks to figure out how to do that, to come up with a, a, a more complex hedging strategy than hedge the whole time or don't hedge. And one of the cool things about deep hedging is that it gives us a quantitative answer to that question that is designed to minimize the reserves that you have to hold. There's another problem with uh, um, kind of the traditional risk neutral calculation of uh, reserves when you want to include hedges. And this is something called the nested stochastics problem. 
So if you remember, the way that the reserve is calculated is you have to run a Monte Carlo simulation in the real world probability measure, and you'll look at the lifetime P&L distribution uh, from the insurer's perspective. So if you want to include a rules-based hedging program in that calculation, that means on every path and on every path date of that um, reserve Monte Carlo simulation, you have to calculate your delta. But in general, that delta requires its own Monte Carlo simulation. So at every path and every path that you have to kind of do a nested Monte Carlo simulation to get the delta. So you end up with this kind of nested Monte Carlo simulation that's really computationally expensive. Um, and uh, practically it means that a lot of insurers just don't have the computational resources to do that efficiently. Um, and so they're again incentivized not to include a rules-based hedging program in reserves. Deep hedging avoids this problem. That's because to calculate your delta at any point, you just have to uh, evaluate a neural network, which is much, much faster than running a second Monte Carlo simulation. So in addition to giving you a uh, more efficient hedging strategy, it also lets you do it in a computationally reasonable amount of time. So let's look at some results. Um, the, uh, uh, the first uh, thing we wanna look at is whether or not this reproduces results that we know it's supposed to. Um, that's where you always wanna start when you're looking at some new algorithm. You know, does it, uh, repro does it reproduce what I know it should do in some limit? So the limit we're gonna look at is when the equity drift is well below that hedging threshold. So in that case, um, it's always uh, the, the optimal hedging strategy is the risk neutral hedging strategy. And so deep hedging should converge to that. So here I'm looking at an example where the equity drift is zero, 20% volatility, five year variable annuity portfolio. I got four charts here and the charts are showing me delta versus spot at four different times. So the first one is a calendar time zero year. So that's when we first put on the position all the way through to four and three quarter years, so when there's only 0.25 years left in the life of my variable annuity. X-axis is spot and Y-axis is delta. There's actually two lines here. Um, the orange line is the, the Black-Scholes delta. I use Black-Scholes and risk neutral kind of interchangeably here. Um, and so it looks like what you'd have as a hedge for a put portfolio. Um, and the blue line is the deep hedging one. It's kind of hard to see that there's two different lines because they line up almost exactly and so fortunately, again, I'm, uh, I'm showing that in the limit where deep hedging is meant to reproduce risk neutral hedging, it does it, right? So that gives me some confidence that um, uh, this technique is actually doing the right thing. We can also look at P&L histograms. So again, I've got um, uh, you know, my P&L histogram here. The, uh, green, uh, the green line is, um, uh, and again, this is for zero equity drift, so the mean of the green distribution, the unhedged distribution is around zero, um, but it's nice and spread out because I'm not hedging. Um, uh, so, in the, so, uh, so that's the, the green distribution. The orange distribution is what I get from risk neutral hedges, and the blue distribution is what I get from deep hedging hedges. So you can see the orange and the blue line up really well, and their expected shortfall is much, much less than what you get from the green distribution. All right, so the deep hedging strategy that's designed to minimize my reserves tells me to do basically the, the risk neutral hedging strategy and that's much better than not hedging at all. So let's look at a, a, a different example. So now we're gonna look at an example where we're kind of near the threshold. So if I go back to my chart of the thresholds here, we're gonna look at a 20% volatility and a 9% drift. So kind of here below this red line where in the traditional risk neutral approach, I'd always want to be using my risk neutral hedges. So if we go back to, uh, to, to this slide that shows the results here, again, I'm showing delta as a function of spot at different times. The orange line is the risk neutral hedges. The blue line is the deep hedger hedges. Um, and you can see it's pretty close, but the, uh, the deep hedger tends to under hedge a little bit. The magnitude of the delta is smaller than it is for, um, uh, for the risk neutral hedges. Um, so it's leaving some of that market risk unhedged, uh, 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 taking advantage of that long equity position paired with the positive equity drift that tends to push the distribution to the right. Um, and so it, uh, it tends to under hedge and it tends to under hedge a little bit more for spots where that put options in the money. <clears throat> 
And we can see this a little bit better if we look at you know, histograms again. So here the, uh, the green distribution, this is my PNL histogram, the lifetime PNL of my variable annuity if I don't do any hedges. Um, and so you can see again, it's shifted over to the right here. Um, the, uh, the orange distribution is the, uh, what I get from doing risk neutral hedges. And the blue one is what I get from doing uh, the deep hedger hedges. And so uh, just qualitatively, you can look at it and see like the blue distribution is kind of shifted to the right. It's maybe a little bit wider than the orange distribution, but the 70 percentile expected shortfall is smaller. Um, and this example is to quantify it. Um, for uh, uh, if I uh, don't hedge at all, then uh, the expected shortfall is 12 cents. Um, this is for $100 of initial assets under management. Um, 13 cents for the risk neutral hedges for the black shoals hedges and four cents for the deep hedger. Um, so it materially re reduces the reserve you have to hold um, by doing the, uh, the deep hedger. Um, let's consider a more extreme case now. So this is a case where the equity drift is, uh, is above the threshold. Um, so uh, showing the same kind of thing here where uh, um, the orange lines are the same as what we saw before, the risk neutral hedges. The blue line is what I get out of the deep hedger. And so you can see it's really materially under hedging, especially you know, uh, down here at low spots where the put options in the, the most in the money. So I get the most benefit from uh, you know, kind of leaving my risk unhedged and uh, getting a bump from the, um, uh, uh, from the positive drift. Um, so here I'm getting like materially different results from the deep hedger than, uh, than I would from, uh, from risk neutral pricing. Um, and again, we can look at the, uh, the um, P&L histograms to get a, a more qualitative view of this. Again, the green distribution here is the, um, the unhedged distribution. Um, it actually has a negative expected shortfall, like the expected loss conditioned on losing more than the 70% of value at risk is actually a positive number or a negative number. It's shifted so far to the right. Um, the orange one is the risk neutral hedges, still around zero. And the blue one is the deep hedger hedges. Again, a little bit broader, so more variance than the black Scholes distribution, but shifted material, materially to the right. Um, and in fact, it has an, the blue distribution has an expected shortfall of zero in that case um, versus 14 cents uh, for the uh, uh, black Scholes one. Um, uh, so you really start to see some material benefit from using the deep hedger in these cases where drift is sort of at or past the, the, that hedging threshold, the kind of traditional risk neutral hedging threshold. Here's some of those charts uh, that uh, um, you know, show this for a range of equity drifts, kind of going for drifts from drifts that are below the threshold to well above the threshold. So 9% drift here on the left, Remember the threshold is sort of 10.2% or so. 11% is a little bit above, 13 well above, 15 well above, 17 way above. And so you can see the under hedging sort of progressively getting more significant. Um, for 9% drift, like we saw, it was a little bit of an under hedge, 11% some pretty significant. And then eventually when we get to 17% drift, it's not hedging at all. It's kind of falling back to the, the naive risk neutral thing of saying like, well, maybe I just shouldn't include any hedging strategy at all. Um, on the bottom, we can see those P&L distributions, the same two that we saw before for 9% and 11% drift, where the blue distribution is what you get from the deep hedger, uh, that is calculating hedges using the deep hedge neural network. The orange is the P&L distribution you get from hedging with risk neutral delta, and the green distribution is what you get from not hedging at all. And so you can see here, the blue distribution sort of gradually starts to converge to the green distribution as I increase the drift further and further and make it um, uh, more and more beneficial uh, to run unhedged and get the advantage of the equity drift kind of pushing my distribution to the right. Um, so uh, uh, so um, there's some conclusions. And before I jump into the conclusions, just wanna give people an opportunity to ask questions. If you do have questions, please type them into the chat, uh, the chat window and we'll, we'll see them there. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll uh, answer those questions, uh, you know, at, at the end after we go through this final slide. Um, so, uh, so in conclusion, uh, 
uh, deep hedging is a practical application of neural networks to front office derivatives and uh, pricing and hedging problems. The first example uh, that that really matters that, that I've seen before. I, I, we're really excited about it at Beacon um, uh, because we think being able to apply machine learning to, to real financial problems, something a lot of people are looking at, um, and uh, uh, and we want to be able to to kind of take advantage of that. There's two key insights for variable annuity hedging and reserve calculations that come out of this. The first one is that there is this um, uh, threshold that you get from uh, just thinking about things in terms of risk neutral hedges, a threshold below which you want to include a hedge, the risk neutral hedging strategy in your reserve calculation, and above which you don't want to include it. And you don't want to include it because the drift is so large that the unhedged distribution gets shifted so far to the right that you get a smaller expected shortfall by not including a hedging strategy than including it. Um, the point that we were trying to make here, though, is that that's kind of a, a false trade-off. Deep hedging actually gives you something better. It tells you a generalized hedging strategy that kind of interpolates between those two limits in some meaningful sense. That gives you a better hedging strategy in terms of P&L outcomes designed to minimize your reserves that you have to hold. Um, second, uh, traditional risk-neutral pricing uh, and hedging has this problem where it becomes really computationally expensive to calculate your post-hedges P&L distribution because you have one Monte Carlo simulation to calculate that distribution. On every path and on every path date, you have to go and um, uh, uh, calculate a delta with another Monte Carlo simulation. So you have this kind of nested Monte Carlo simulation to get hedge notionals. That's really computationally expensive. With deep hedging, you don't need to do that. Instead, you can just evaluate a neural network to get the hedges. Uh, so it makes that um, post-hedges P&L distribution problem much more computationally feasible. So the upshot of all this is deep hedging lets insurers more optimally minimize their variable annuity reserves that they have to hold, while also making the reserve calculation computationally feasible and giving them like a better hedging strategy um, where better is defined in terms of minim minimizing some convex risk measure of your P&L distribution. Um, uh, future work, uh, um, so we've looked at a relatively simple case here where we have geometric rounding motion as the underlying dynamical model. Um, you can extend it to uh, the kinds of models that you're required to use by regulators uh, to calculate uh, reserves, which is stochastic volatility and stochastic interest rates. And if you want to do that, then you have to incorpor incorporate not just delta hedges, but also vega hedges and interest rate hedges. Um, and then add in unhedgeable longevity risk and all this, we were assuming that there is kind of an infinitely large portfolio of underlying investors um, so that uh, um, uh, that longevity risk is diversified away. But one of the cool things about deep hedging is that you don't need to make that assumption. You can incorporate unhedgeable risks into the machine as well, as well as realistic mortality modeling or not beyond our simple, like everyone has the same probability of dying per unit time. Uh, and also extended to more complex variable annuity structures. That simple example that we talked about is is relatively rare. That most of them have all sorts of bells and whistles, um, and uh, we could extend to those too. Um, so, uh, uh, so with that, I'm happy to turn to some questions. Um, first question: uh, uh, Doesn't this still depend on a model? Um, that's a great question. In fact, it does. So this isn't sort of a model independent machine learning framework. It still is a model dependent framework, model dependent in just the same way that risk neutral pricing is uh, is model dependent. Um, uh, so you still have the same kind of universe of uh, stochastic volatility models, dynamical interest rate models, all that kind of stuff, all the stuff that we've grown to know and love through risk neutral pricing. The difference is this is a different numerical technique for telling you more optimal hedges to do when risk neutral assumptions are violated. Um, uh, second question, um, why does it look like it's under hedging more for smaller spots? So if we go back to, uh, to this slide here, the, uh, the, uh, these graphs show delta as a function of spot. Um, the orange lines are the risk neutral hedges and the blue lines are the deep hedger hedges. And so you can see um, 
typically it tends to, the, the amount that it under hedges is typically larger when equity spots are smaller. And the reason for that is really that in that case, that's when the delta of this put option that you've sold is the largest and you kind of get the most kick for uh, for running an unhedged position from the uh, from the drift. Um, uh, another question: um, How expensive is the training of the neural network? This is a great question. So um, we noted in the you know to avoid this nested stochastics issue, um, the the reason you avoid it is because you only have to evaluate a neural network once to calculate your uh, your hedge ratio instead of running a full-on Monte Carlo simulation. But that assumes that you have a trained neural network already. Um, and so uh, to do neural network training, you basically have to do these batches of Monte Carlo simulations to train the neural network. Uh, in practice, we found uh, the training times on kind of a normal computer running in AWS uh, is about two or three minutes. Um, so it's really pretty quick for the simple examples that we've looked at. I think one of the outstanding questions we have and that we're starting to explore more as we extend our, our R&D work here is what happens when we generalize this more? When we you know, move to a stochastic volatility model, stochastic interest rate model, more complex structures, longer dated products, um, you know, how does that uh, training time uh, change? Um, and so that, that's, that's still stuff that's, uh, that, that, we're, that we're looking at. But we think still, the net result of that is going to be that um, uh, much less computationally expensive than the original nested stochastics problem. So any, any other questions from anyone in the audience? All right, uh, looks like that's it. So I uh, just want to say thank you. Um, you know, hope you found this interesting. Uh, if you have any questions on this or what we do at Beacon, feel free to drop us a note at uh, email address info at beacon.io. All right, thank you, everyone.